Good afternoon from Washington, D.C. I'm Adam Nam, the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission of the Organization of American States. I welcome you on behalf of all of us in the CCAD Executive Secretariat to this webinar. And let me say, I hope all of you, your families and colleagues are well during this uh, crisis. This webinar is part of a new series of CCAD online seminars that aim not just to provide quality content to our partners across the hemisphere during the pandemic, but also to provide an opportunity for you to interact directly with some of the experts who collaborate with us. Moreover, we know that COVID-19 presents a challenge to drug treatment court programs everywhere. Our member states will need to innovate in response and CCAD stands ready to assist. Today, we are fortunate to have as our presenter, Dr. Douglas Marlowe. My team will introduce Dr. Marlowe in greater detail in a moment, but suffice to say that he is one of the world's foremost experts in studying drug treatment courts. He is also a principal officer of the world's first manual on monitoring and evaluation drug treatment courts, uh, monitoring and evaluating drug treatment courts, which I'm proud to say was published by CCAD just last year. And if I had a copy, I would be holding it up right now. Unfortunately, it is on my uh, credenza in the office, which I can't get to. Uh, the manual, which is the subject of Dr. Marlowe's presentation today, forms the bedrock of an effort by all our Alternatives to Incarceration program, aimed at expanding monitoring and evaluation of best practices throughout the Western Hemisphere. It will also be a fundamental part of some of our work in the hemisphere over the next two years, as we work with member states to improve their capacities in this area. So thank you, Dr. Marlowe, for your willingness to speak and thank you to everyone in the audience for your presence today. I hope you find the content useful and welcome any feedback you might have. With that, let me hand the discussion over to the manager of our therapeutic justice program, Mr. Jeff Zinsmeister, who will introduce the speaker and provide you with some context on the publication and use of this manual. Jeff. Thank you for the introduction, Ambassador. Uh, as, as Ambassador Nam noted, I am the manager of uh, CCAD's Therapeutic Justice Program, which is part of the Institutional Strengthening Unit. Uh, really appreciate everybody's um, attendance here today. Thanks for taking time out to, to, to join us. I think we're gonna have a a really uh, great discussion today. Uh, we're going, we, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate enough uh, to, to have uh, Dr. Dr. Doug Marlow, uh, Douglas Marlow, who uh, is the Senior Scientific Consultant for the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, NADCP, uh, and the Senior Science Policy Adv and Policy Advisor for uh, Alcohol Monitoring Systems. Uh, and he's also, uh, and really, uh, to be very frank, He's really the leading or one of the leading experts in uh, research on drug treatment courts and the principal author of uh, CCAD's uh, manual on the scientific monitoring evaluation of drug courts in the Americas. Uh, we'll share a link in the chat uh, with folks here at some point. It's also in the invitation that, that everyone here receives. And his, his, the focus of his uh, presentation today is going to be that very uh, manual uh, what went into to, to its design and 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 when, why it was uh, why it was written and a little bit about its contents, how to use it, um, so forth. I mean, and, and you really there could be no better person to to, to deliver this discussion. Uh, Dr. Marlow has published over 175 uh, journal articles, monographs, books, and book chapters on not just drug treatment courts, but on other topics like correctional rehabilitation, forensic psychology and the treatment of substance uh, use disorders. So he has a really wide range of expertise on this issue and on um, alternatives to incarceration generally. Uh, he's also the editor in chief of the Journal for Advancing Justice. He serves on the editorial board of Criminal Justice and Behavior and he was pre previously the editor in chief of the Drug Court Review. 
So uh, the man knows what he's talking about. Um, and before we hand over the, uh, the floor to him, um, my colleague, Pam, uh, Pam Westfall, is going to walk us through a little bit about just uh, you know, some rules of the road, how this, um, how this webinar is going to work, how to ask questions, and so forth. So uh, with that, uh, Pam, would you, uh, would you like to, to take it from here? Hello, everybody. It is great to have you all here. I, as my colleague Jeff uh, Sensmeister just said, I am going to share with you uh, the rules of the road. Um, here are some things to have into consideration uh, throughout, throughout the course of the presentation. So everybody's uh, microphones will remain on mute. Uh, so if you have any questions or something, please feel free uh, to send it through the Q&A, which is like the, the next point in our, and, in, the, in, in this slide. Uh, every question should be submitted using the Q&A function. We will review the questions and ask as many as time allows during the Q&A session. Um, it's also uh, worth mentioning that this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to view it later using the same link that you already received. And uh, just a small disclaimer, the content of this seminar is exclusively informative and does not necessarily reflect the position or opinion of the Executive Secretariat of CCAD, the Organization of American States, and its General Secretariat or its member states. Um, that said, without further ado, I am glad to introduce you to Dr. Marlowe. Thank you, Pam. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar. I pray that you and your families are safe and, and healthy in this difficult time. And I appreciate your joining us for this webinar. We've been told to practice social distancing, but that's the last thing that we should be doing. We should be practicing physical distancing. We should be practicing biological distancing, but social proximity. We need to be able to connect with each other, meet with each other, and, um, and uh, educate each other. So this, this pandemic has had two very powerful effects on the justice system. The first is that it is pressing on all of the fault lines in our system. It's showing all the things that we are doing ineffectively. Housing people in large correctional institutions with poor quality health care, community supervision that, that focuses on, on uh, 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 meetings in, in offices instead of using mobile and other kinds of technologies to stay in touch with people. So it has shown how far behind we are in terms of evidence-based practices. At the same time, the public has, has glommed on to the need for evidence-based practices. The public wants to hear from experts now. They don't really want to hear from politicians. So we have a fleeting opportunity to bring evidence-based practices to justice reform. So what do we know about the effects of different correctional institutions on crime. We know that the average effect of incarceration on crime is ranges from no effect on crime to about an 8% increase in crime. The uh, incapacitation effects we get from keeping people in jail and prison off the streets is offset by increases in crime upon release so that the net effect of incarceration is generally a negative. Community supervision, traditional probation, parole, intensive probation programs have a net effect of about a 0% increase on crime. Referring people to community-based treatment instead of, in lieu of, criminal justice supervision is associated with about a 7% decrease in crime, so there is an effect. When we combine community supervision with treatment, so there's monitoring by justice authorities and provision of treatment. We get about a 10% reduction in crime. And finally, drug court programs, which use a combination of treatment and supervision, but are run by the courts. They're court supervised, judge supervised programs, interdisciplinary programs, average about a 14% increase in crime. So if this is what our effects are, it's unfortunate that the most common sentences, dispositions imposed in the United States and around the world are incarceration or traditional probation, parole, perhaps intensive probation, parole, supervision programs. 
the programs that have the most demonstrable effects on crime are the least commonly used programs, are most optimistic projections are that drug courts and, and uh, integrated programs are serving somewhere around three to 5% of the people that need them. We are now in an age of criminal justice reform move, uh, movement where individuals or advocates are pushing for us to send people to treatment, focus on treatment instead of or in lieu of criminal justice processing. So while that is certainly a step up from incarceration and traditional community uh, justice approaches, it's actually a step backwards from what we actually know to be the most effective programs. So this is a time as, we are, as we're engaged in a public debate about justice reform to have data and facts inform this discussion. Drug courts are not just the most proven interventions in the program, but we have done about 30 years of research to establish what is it about drug courts that are associated with it, they're appropriate with their most effective outcomes. We call these best practices. A best practice is something that when a drug court does it, its outcomes are 50 to 100% better than programs that don't do it in terms of reducing crime and returning net cost benefits back to community, the taxpayers and the like. We know from lots of research that drug courts have their best effects on individuals who have a high risk or a high likelihood of criminal recidivism. We call those high risk individuals or a high likelihood of failure on traditional correctional programs like probation. And they are also high need. Individuals with severe addictions, co-occurring mental health disorders, homelessness, these are the individuals that get the best effects from drug court programs. And in fact, drug courts are actually can even be a waste of resources and counterproductive if they treat people who don't have serious uh, substance use disorders, don't have a high likelihood of recidivism. We have learned that drug courts are greater than the sum of the parts, that having a judge, having probation, having uh, defense counsel, prosecutors, treatment providers, all on the team, an interdisciplinary team, leads to better outcomes. And when those individuals regularly meet in staff meetings to discuss cases and plan for court hearings, effects are 50 to 100% better. In fact, what we've learned is that if any member of the drug court team, any one person, is not showing up at staffings, is not contributing to team discussions, the average effect of that drug court is cut in half. It is a group team-based intervention. We have found, and, and a lot of this research is based in the United States, Canada, and Australia, which I'll talk about in, in a bit. We don't know for sure how this applies in other countries, but we do know that in drug court programs, holding court hearings, where participants are appearing before the judge at least every two weeks or more often, have substantially better outcomes. In fact, I've done studies where we've randomly assigned people in drug courts to see the judge every two weeks, or to see the judge less often, say once a month. And th we had to stop those studies prematurely because people who were seeing the judge less frequently than every two weeks were doing so badly that it was no longer really ethical or appropriate to continue running a drug court with such infrequent court reviews. We have found by actually timing it that judges who spend less than three minutes interacting with participants in court have substantially poorer outcomes. So there is something about that judge participant discussion that clearly uh, leads to better results. We've learned that doing random drug and alcohol testing at least twice per week is associated with substantially better outcomes and drug courts that are doing pre-scheduled testing on a once a week or twice a month or once a month basis are basically ineffective. They really have no better outcomes. We've learned that a 14 to 18 month curriculum seems to be ideal. Less is teach too little, and after that, programs tend to be too long. So we've really studied what it takes to run these programs. We have found that relying exclusively on group-based interventions is not enough, that weekly individual counseling for at least the first 90 days is required for effective drug court outcomes. We've learned through painful experience about the importance of medication-assisted treatment especially for treatment of opioid use disorders. Unfortunately, about half of drug courts in the US are not using medication-assisted uh, treatments despite this knowledge. 
we've learned that jail sanctions, although they do have a place and a role in drug courts, when jail sanctions are being administered weeks or months in length, they lead to poor outcomes. Jail sanctions that are no more than three, at most five days, brief, staccato, and getting the person back into treatment are the most effective programs. I don't review this to tell you, this is not a talk about what drug courts should be doing. The purpose of doing this is not so much to, uh, to, to prove that this is necessarily what drug courts in other countries should be doing. What the, the importance of this is showing us what drug courts should be studying, what the key components of these interventions appear to be, and what helps us to separate out what really is and is not a drug court or what is and is what is not a poorly functioning drug court that may be pulling down uh, the effects for the group as a whole. Given the fact that drug courts are the most uh, carefully studied program in the criminal justice system, if we look at the timeline for progress of drug courts in the United States, it has moved at a snail's pace. The first drug court was founded in the United States in 1989. It wasn't until 16 years later in 2005 that what we call our government accountability office, this is the office that, um, that uh, evaluates the effectiveness of federally funded programs, concluded that there was enough research to conclude that drug courts were. It took 16 years before they were acknowledged as an evidence-based intervention. It took six more years before the National Institute of Justice, another research arm of our Department of Justice, concluded that in addition to reducing crime, drug courts actually reduce drug use. They actually improve people's mental health. They actually return cost benefits to their communities. So we're now 21 years out before we even had those data. Add another year before researchers were able to figure out who the target population is, the high risk, high needs individuals. Began to separate out what the effective and ineffective practices are within drug courts. Starting in 2013, volume one, and in 2015, volume two, were of our best practice standards. It wasn't until about 25 years after drug courts came into existence that we actually had a standard of care for what a drug court needed to be doing in order to even call itself a drug court or to say that it was following the drug court model. We are now 31 years out in the year 2020, and what are we dealing with in the year 2020? First, we're dealing with dissemination and quality assurance. We're trying to get drug courts to follow the best practice standards. And although many do, and most are trying to, there are a substantial minority of drug courts not complying with best practices, and some that don't even know what those best practices are. We are also dealing with other kinds of drug courts. All this research was done in adult criminal drug courts, but we also have juvenile drug courts. We have family drug courts for child abuse and neglect and dependency court cases. We have courts for mental health, uh, the treatment of mental health disorders. And the question we've been confronting is, we have, do we have to do all of this over again for all of those other courts to know what their practices are, or can we learn common lessons? In the midst of all of this, the ground has fallen out from beneath our feet. We are now in the midst of the COVID-19 epidemic, which has shown us that we must be using mobile and remote technologies. How can we do biweekly status reviews? How can we do twice weekly testing? How can we give people individual counseling on a weekly basis in the midst of social distancing and quarantines? The only way is through embracing mobile technology and drug courts for the most part do very little, if any of that. We are still in the midst of an opioid crisis in our country and many other countries. And many drug courts are not using medication assisted treatment either because they don't know about them, are resistant to them, or they simply don't have any connections with physicians and with the medical community because drug courts came out of an originally out of an abstinence based model and we focused on no drug use, no medications, and we have to adjust and we have to adapt to, uh, to you know, new uh, findings in medicine, quite frankly. Many uh, countries, the US especially, is moving away from criminalizing drug possession 
and uh, decriminalizing marijuana and many drug possession related offenses, making them misdemeanor offenses or summary offenses instead of felonies. Drug courts have focused on felony level possession cases in our country. They've lost their target population. They need to adapt. We need to figure out who should be in drug courts. Now, these are all in some respect good developments because drug courts should be servicing far more than drug possession cases. They always should have been servicing uh, individuals charged with serious offenses fueled by an addiction, but we are now scrambling to figure out what our practices need to be as the world around us has changed. Why has it taken us so long to do this? We have the most effective model, we're 30 years out and we're still trying to get the word out. Why? Several issues. One is the problem of comparison groups. For the first 15 years, drug courts were comparing the people who graduated to the people who dropped out of the program or failed, and if the graduates did better, concluding the program worked. Or comparing people in drug courts to people who said, I don't want to be in drug court, refused to go, or who the prosecutor wouldn't let in because their charges were too severe. These were biased comparison groups, and many people, uh, scientists and policymakers, recognized that. They didn't buy it. We were using the wrong comparison groups. That's why it took so long. Definitions of recidivism. If you want to make it look like you have a, a low recidivism rate, define recidivism as convictions in a year. It takes a while for individuals to re-engage in criminal behavior, to get caught, to have the charges brought, and to be convicted. A year, that rarely happens within the course of a year. You get very low recidivism rates uh, because of the way you defined recidivism. So we have to define recidivism, recidivism based on arrests, based on convictions, based on incarceration, based on self-report for different time periods and it has to be well measured. So we didn't have good outcomes. The black box, we call the black box as a euphemism for not knowing what goes on in a drug court. We didn't know what drug courts were actually doing. How often were they holding their court hearings? How much treatment were they actually providing? Were they providing medication-assisted treatment? Were they doing drug testing? None of that information was even collected, analyzed, or reported. So if one drug court did good, another drug court didn't, and we averaged their effects, the effects were pretty medio mediocre, and we couldn't tell why. There was so much noise. Practice standards or guidelines. We didn't have any basis for telling drug courts what the right answer was. How often should you be bringing people to court? How many individual sessions should you be having? How, many, how often should you be drug testing? Without that information, we couldn't hold programs to accountability. And we had a wide range of that. Drug courts were treating whoever they chose to treat instead of who did best in a drug court. Many drug courts were skimming you know, first time uh, marijuana possession cases, for example. Well, those are low risk, low needs cases and drug courts don't have their best effects with that population. So we needed to get drug courts to, ta to target the right people for their programs. And we had very little basis for knowing whether drug courts were cost effective. How do we measure the cost of one less arrest? How do we measure the cost savings of, the, of incarceration? So we needed to be able to uh, attach dollar values to what was taking place in drug courts. Which brings us to the evaluation manual. The purpose of this manual was to help drug courts, not just in the US, but uh, preferably or, or, or most importantly, in the broader Americas, Canada, Mexico, South America, Caribbean nations, to not make the same mistakes, to not move at the same snail's pace that the US did, to not have the same un, you know, uh, conflicting confusing findings because of definitional problems and measurement problems. So the manual talks about what are valid comparison groups and analysis. It talks about the best ways to, to, do, to comprise, to put together a comparison group, and it explains why many commonly used comparison groups are not effective. Now, if you have no choice and you have to use a less than perfect comparison group, there are ways to fix that statistically. And so the manual helps you to make sure that your analyses are fair and appropriate so that they will be 
um, credited by other scientists and by policymakers. How to measure risk and need of the participants so that you're getting the right individuals into your programs. Instead of basing how people get into drug courts on particular eligible offenses or a negotiation or a plea bargain between the defense and the prosecution, instead getting people into drug courts because they meet the appropriate targeting criteria, helping uh, programs to collect the right information to measure risk and needs of their participants. Performance indicators. Now this is, drug courts provide court hearings. They provide substance use treatment. They provide what we call complementary services, which are mental health services, employment counseling, family counseling, uh, vocational interventions, those kinds of things. They do drug and alcohol testing. They have probation supervision. They have what we call restorative justice uh, components like victim restitution, doing constructive community service, paying fines and fees. They deliver rewards and sanctions. How do we measure what a drug court is doing, how it's delivering these services, how much service it's actually delivering so we can separate out what are more effective from less effective practices in drug courts. So we can make some, reach some conclusions about some drug courts that may be calling themselves drug courts, but not in fact delivering the, the uh, components of the drug court model. Maybe those programs don't really fit in a drug court evaluation. Maybe they're artificially pulling down the effectiveness of drug courts. There are also performance indicators for how participants are doing in the program. How do we measure attendance in the program? Length of stay. How do we measure drug use, drug and alcohol test results, technical violations, new arrests? There's post-program uh, outcomes. How do we measure recidivism, rearrests, reconvictions, reincarcerations, post-release from the drug court? Housing, employment, mental health, uh, the birth of drug-free babies, which is probably in some respects may be among some of the most important impacts of drug courts, is stopping another generation of drug addiction uh, in our society. And how do we attach cost values to these indicators so that we know not just how much crime has been reduced, how much drug use has been reduced, but what that translates into in terms of cost savings versus cost expenditures for taxpayers, for societies. And how do we measure other attitudinal factor, fact, factors that our clients experience, perceptions of satisfaction with the program, belief that they're being treated fairly in the program, that they have a therapeutic alliance with the judge and with staff, these perceptions these views have been shown to be strongly predictive of outcomes in drug courts. Perhaps they may explain ultimately why drug courts work, because they give people a sense of accountability and ther a therapeutic motive that this is for their good and a sense of fairness, and that bringing these things together may really be what is actually taking place in the short term to bring about longer term outcomes. How do we measure these things? How do we study them? How do we know, how do we test our theories to know if drug court really does what we think it does? In the manual, we have data elements that are recommended in the course of the manual. Now, to, to be clear, when we were had a series of planning meetings uh, through SICAD with, with representatives from many Caribbean, South American nations, Canada, the US, Mexico, he talked about the importance of everybody at least measuring some things the same way so that we could make oranges to oranges comparisons or instead of oranges to apples comparisons so that we could say that drug courts have the same or different effects on recidivism in Caribbean nations than South American nations. If we could know that court hearings are very powerful uh, predictors of outcomes in South American nations, for example, but less so for some reason in Caribbean nations. How do we know that unless we are measuring and studying at least some of what we do equivalently? And so it was agreed that we should at least have a core data set. This is not something anybody's required to do. It's a recommendation that people collect 
information, at least some of the information, in a similar comparable way so we can look at drug courts as a whole in multiple countries at the same time and look at its effects across cultures and see if that if there is something different or if there's not something different about how the program operates. We came up with three categories of data elements. The first are what we call the critical data elements or the core data elements. These are aspects of a drug court that go to what we call the key components of the drug court model. Many of you, if you work in drug courts, have heard of and work with either the US's 10 key components of drug courts or the International Association of Drug Court Professionals, uh, 13 uh, key components of drug courts. This is what defines a drug court. If you are not run by a judge and having hearings in court, it's not really a drug court. Maybe a treatment program, maybe a wonderful program, but a drug court is defined by the judicial leadership and the in-court reviews. If you're not doing probation supervision, if you're not doing drug testing, if there's no supervisory component, that's really not a drug court. Not a value judgment about whether your program is good, it's just not what the model calls for. Also, things that are proven to affect outcomes. If we have, studies have shown that how often individuals appear in court before a judge is highly predictive of outcomes in drug courts, then that should really be a key element for programs to study. And we don't want it to be something that you need to have a PhD and a university department behind you in order to be able to study. These should be things that a program itself, even without statistical or research um, uh, expertise, should be able to measure these elements. Now, what would an example be? An example would be, let's say, the dose of court hearings. How often participants actually appear in court. Court hearings are a key component of the drug court model. They are proven to affect outcomes and measuring how often people come to court, any program should be able to do that. So we call that a core measure. Programs should at least measure and be able to report on how often their participants come to court. The second category is what we call recommended data elements. And the reason they're uh, in colored font on the screen is because in the actual manual, if a data element is in red font, that tells you it's a core or critical element. If it's in blue font, that tells you that it's a recommended data element. These may be things that are harder to measure. Uh, for example, I told you that how many times people come to court predicts outcomes. But if you really want to know how people are doing in a drug court, you don't only want to know how often they came to court, but you want to know how often they were supposed to have come to court. So if I go to court five times and I was only required to go to court five times, my attendance rate was 100%. If I was required to go to court 10 times and I only showed up five times, my attendance rate was only 50%. That is probably a better, closer, more powerful measure, but you also have to measure how many times people were supposed to be in court and didn't show up. Not all programs capture that, quite frankly, and so it makes it a little bit harder for programs to capture that data. It's also what we call partially redundant with other variables. Needless to say, how often people come to court and their attendance rate in court are correlated with each other. They both include how many sessions people actually attended. So the question is, how much more information do you get from the second measure as you do from the first? And so if there's some redundancy, Let's tell programs at least, at a minimum, measure how often people come. And then if you can, keep good information on their attendance rates. This is simply a simple example. And then finally, we have what are called the discretionary data elements. And these are things that are theoretically relevant to drug court, but have not been well studied. So for example, there are many theorists out there who believe that one of the biggest things that predicts the effectiveness of a drug court is the development of a therapeutic alliance between the participant and the judge in court. The judge um, creating a connection with the individual, expressing concern for the individual. The individual feeling that the judge, somebody as powerful as a judge cares about them, that that relationship may be one of the critical predictors of effectiveness in drug courts. 
that is a very likely uh, hypothesis. We all think it carries a lot of value, a lot of promise, but it hasn't been well measured. It takes a lot of work to figure out how to measure people's perceptions. And so it's theoretically relevant, more difficult. And so we put that in the discretionary data element. In the manual, you will actually see tables which list all the elements of drug courts that need to be measured in a drug court, how, what the formulas are for measuring those things, which ones are recommended, which ones are um, uh, uh, core elements, which are discretionary. And we also list benchmarks. Now, what's a benchmark? A benchmark is what you should be shooting for in terms of a value on your performance indicator. So for example, we said that court hearings, measuring court hearings is a performance indicator. But we, the evidence suggests that having people come every other week in court is associated with better outcomes. So a benchmark is people coming to court every two weeks. So if a drug court wants to know whether it's meeting a benchmark, that is also in the manual and you can measure whether you are or not meeting those benchmarks and whether it matters because those benchmarks have been identified in mostly the United States, Australia, and Canada. That's where most of the studies of benchmarks have occurred. We don't know if those same benchmarks apply in Chile or in, um, uh, in Mexico or in Brazil or in Jamaica. We don't know. And so it, we, you could at least measure the degree to which your programs are or are not meeting those benchmarks how effective they are so that you can begin to develop benchmarks for your own programs. These, these uh, formulas are very simple. They're very easy. Anybody could do it. You don't need somebody with a PhD working in your program. You just need somebody who knows how to set up a spreadsheet and is attentive to capturing information. The intended aims of this manual are number one, to help OAS member states avoid common errors in monitoring and evaluation. We don't want you to make all the same painful mistakes we did, using the wrong comparison groups, measuring recidivism in many different ways that doesn't give accurate information, failing to capture information in the black box. We need, we, we don't want you to, to, to uh, expend so much time like we did and take 16 years to have enough information for the experts to think that in fact, we had marshaled the evidence for drug courts. We want to encourage more rapid identification and adoption of best practices. We don't want you to just do what works in other, in our countries, in other countries. We want to know what works in your country, and we want to know what other things that we have not studied well contribute to better outcomes. You may have theories, hypotheses, ideas in your countries that can be studied, and they will help the field. And we want to bring more and more information, bring an international and a multicultural, a diverse perspective to the base, the knowledge base on drug courts. As I said, we want to help member nations to identify their own performance benchmarks. We wanna know whether biweekly court hearings every two weeks is necessary across the board. Is that, a, is that a universal principle or is that just something in countries with a essentially Eurocentric type history or, or, a, or a, 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 a European background? We want, we're, we're asking, there's no, we have no, we have no authority to tell anybody to do anything, but we are hoping that different countries will at least collect the common core data set of easy to collect, easy to measure uh, items that go to the key components of the drug court model and things that have been proven at least in other states to affect outcomes. We would love to be able to look at the effects of drug courts across cultures. And that can't be done if information is collected differently by different cultures. Then we don't know if it's really about the drug court model or it's just about how the research was done. 
And the purpose for all of this, when all said and done, is to do what works. The goal here is to enhance public health, enhance public safety, and enhance justice. And drug courts are intended to do that. And yet our, our uh, ability to, to, to reach the people that need us, our ability to steer justice reform has not been what it needs to be. The lessons of empiricism, the lessons of the evidence-based practices have not permeated our justice systems. Our justice systems continue to rely on incarceration. They continue to rely on, a, as an alternative community supervision and sanctioning. And the leading justice reform uh, uh, measures of today are basically saying that the criminal justice system, the justice system, is not a potential solution to social ills. It is the cause of social ills, or it makes social ills worse. And therefore, the way to improve our society, the way to improve our public health and our public safety is to have less criminal justice system. I don't believe that. I don't think the evidence supports that. We need the criminal justice system doing what's effective and following evidence-based practices. So thank you. With that, I'm going to turn my screen back to Pamela. I think we're just about right on time. And I'm hope, happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we're so grateful to have you here. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. The first one is the following. The question says, would you please tell us what the most basic things a drug court uh, should measure and track? Okay. So the, the, the most important things to measure and track, and these are in the manual, what we call our core measures. And I think, as I remember correctly, I think there's only about 10 of them. It is uh, court supervision, so the, the, the uh, uh, number of sessions attended. It is hours of substance use treatment, so how many sessions they actually receive. It is the uh, number of drug or alcohol tests scheduled. It is length of stay. Oh, probation, number of probation sessions. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, racial, ethic, and gender uh, equivalence. So looking at, you know, looking at uh, access and completion rates by race and gender. I believe those are the core, but they're all in the manual. They're clearly laid out. Fantastic. And um, actually, at the very beginning of the, of the webinar, Jeff uh, shared with all the participants the link to the manual. The manual is online and available in both English and Spanish. So uh, please feel free to, you can click on the link uh, through the chat or just um, Google manual full for monitoring and evaluation, um, CCAD, and you'll be able to find it very easily. Or can, I, can, I, can I also, I want to say one thing about the manual, something I just noticed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. is that in the actual calculations for the performance measures, there are some places where division signs were not, they got knocked out in the printing stage. It should be self-evident where something has a numerator and a denominator. So if there's some confusion, it's just because there's some missing uh, division points and we'll get that fixed. But it should be, it's very straightforward and, and it's explained in the text. Fantastic. Um, we're gonna go to the second question. Uh, which says, do you suggest a university should be involved in the monitoring and evaluation process as an external actor? So the, the, the answer is, if you have that available to you, absolutely, positively, yes. Every drug court, in my opinion, should make a connection with a local college or university. Uh, the departments that are going to be most interested will be psychology departments, criminal justice, sociology, social work, and maybe even a medical school especially if you're dealing with opioid uh, uh, individual, you know, people with opioid disorders, you want to get somebody who is um, working on a, a senior thesis or a dissertation. So this becomes their dissertation. That means that they are not only doing this, they may do it, by the way, for no pay, but also their degree depends on them doing it and they're being supervised by, by core faculty. So you're getting the highest level supervision um, but I don't want to say this in a sense that you have to have that. I'm saying it's a great idea. I believe that programs, assuming that you're ethical, and I do, 
and you're not playing with the data, if you follow the, the guidelines we're given, most programs can evaluate themselves without external support. It's just better to have somebody with it, you know, uh, who has, is just more familiar with how to do it. So yes, I would absolutely work with local universities and I guarantee you, they're gonna wanna work with you. Okay, so um, the next questions uh, relate, uh, we're sort of consolidating a few questions here into one. A um, few folks have asked about managing DTCs during the, this pandemic. And you know, if you had any suggestions that, about how to address uh, running a DTC during this period uh, so that data collection can continue and also so that, um, you know, that services can continue to be provided uh, even if you're not having in-person hearings. So uh, the first thing I would say is that on uh, Thursday, um, April 30th, so a week from tomorrow, I am doing a webinar on that exact topic. It's, it's uh, sponsored by the American Probation and Parole Association and the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals. So if you go online, you can uh, register for it. It's at 3 p.m. Eastern time, a uh, week from tomorrow. I'm sorry, a week from this Thursday, not a week from tomorrow. And so I'll be going in detail about this. The short answer is that this is a time to be using uh, remote technologies, and there are many of them that can be used. And so smart, what, first thing we did, and this is true in the US, 97% of drug court and probation uh, participants have cell phones. And 92% of them have ready access to them on a regular basis and answer text within five minutes. Therefore, you can be doing probation check-ins, having them, right, probation officer sends them a text, says, put on your, turn on your FaceTime so that you can see them and you can have a check-in with them. There's actually technologies now where you can even take a breathalyzer sample. You can have them drop a pin where they are and you can have them fill out forms about how they're doing. You can do online, there are many online support groups now, 12 step meetings, smart recovery meetings. You should get them involved in those online support groups and have your own alumni association develop its own chat room support thing. There are online assignments that you can be giving people so they work on their thought exercises, they work on relapse triggers for drug use, they work on cognitive behavioral exercises, and these things send information back to you so you know whether they are in fact logging on, how long they're on, whether they're doing it, you actually then deliver rewards right over the phone. Congratulations, you got, you know, you earned a day off of your community service obligations. You, lost, you earned a day off of your fine, or a certain amount of fines and fees. You've had time credits for a week of the program, so you can be doing this. The key here is copious, positive reinforcement for staying connected. Uh, we use the word proximal behaviors, the things to focus on. Right now, focus on staying in touch with the program. Doing your exercises and we'll give you rewards. Don't threaten that you're going to throw people in jail for using drugs when you, A, you can't do it, B, you can't measure it, and C, it's probably not as effective. Anyway, this is time for welfare checks, not compliance checks. So, but I'm going to be going into great detail about the technologies that are out there. They already exist and how to use them. Uh, I hope you all, hope you'll tune in a week from Thursday. Great, thank you, Doug. And I, I, one, one follow-up question too. I understand that you've done some research. I remember you presented at NDCP's conference last year about um, using technology and distance tools to, uh, to assist in follow-up and monitoring. Is that, is that uh, publication or is that, that presentation available publicly somewhere? Uh, the presentation is, pr almost, is almost certainly available on NADCP's website. Uh, they keep, they, they, uh, they, uh, you know, keep all those things. Uh, if not, I'm certainly happy to send the uh, slides to anybody who asked for it. Some of that material I will be dealing with this coming Thursday. I'll be covering some of that, proving how it improves outcomes. But I also want you all to know that NADCP's national conference, which was in May, 
has been canceled for obvious reasons, and we are doing it online. And one of my presentations at the conference, which will be either May 28th or May 29th, is going to be that exact presentation again. And it will get, I'll be doing it live, but it will also, it will be archived, it will be taped. So there are many places where you can get it. But what I basically go through is to show that, forget about COVID, you know, forget about this pandemic. We should have been using these technologies all along anyway, because they make outcomes better. We should have been, you know, you, you have your face-to-face -face meeting with somebody, and then you give them some homework assignments to do online. That's what we should have been doing all along. And the data shows outcomes are better, and I'll show you where all those data are. Great. So this is something that people should be considering regardless. You should be doing this even if, God willing, they find a cure to this thing tomorrow, and we're all back in our offices next week, do it anyway. Great. Great. And, you know, if you have a link to, uh, to, to, to the, 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 uh, the webinar, the upcoming webinar, we'll be happy to share it uh, with our participants will, here in the chat, that. too. Um, okay. uh, Pam, you want to ask the next question? Yeah. Uh, so the next question is from Tiffany Berry, and she says, uh, what is the recommended time frame for evaluating a drug treatment court, and who should conduct this evaluation? So the time frame, I talk, we talk about this a lot in the manual, the time frame, the follow-up period depends on what the outcome measure is. So we use the word monitoring to show whether the program is delivering the appropriate services short term. And if it is, research says, if you, get the, if you deliver the right services, they're gonna get better later. The real question is, are they getting their services now? So you should start measuring attendance rates in court, attendance rates in counseling sessions, right from the beginning and reporting them every three months while they're in the program. If you're measuring technical violation rates, that's going to be at least about 12 months out. If you're measuring recidivism, re-arrest, reconvictions, it's going to be generally a minimum of two months, two years out, 24 months, because you just don't, there's not enough time basically to really capture differences. You want to ideally measure three years out, and if you really want to be great about this, we all want to be great, five years out is the best. I'm not saying wait five years and don't measure in between, but if you could keep following your participants, their, their recidivism rates for five years, what the research tells us is if you can keep somebody arrest free for five years, chances are they're going to stay arrest free. So it's like, it's kind of like when people have cancer and you have your five year survival rate, same thing's true here, make those five years. So measure services, this is all in the manual, measure services delivered, technical violations, attendance rates, right from the get-go, report them at six and 12 month intervals, measure graduation rates and technical violations at, a, at completion, measure recidivism from two to five years. Who should do it? It depends on what you're trying to do. If, you're, if, you're, if you follow best practices and do good quality research, Anybody should be able to do it, right? If, you know, so you just have to be able to follow the rules. Uh, if you want other people to believe you, then you want to have somebody who's independent, who's not, who doesn't care whether, you know, uh, you know, whether a program looks good or bad. So if I come in and study a program, I don't care if the judge gets mad at me. I mean, I may care, but I'm going to say it anyway. And so you want to be able to have somebody who's independent, who can deliver news, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, that also sometimes makes it easier in terms of getting published and that kind of thing. But my view is anybody with a, with a master's degree or better can do this. You want to do sophisticated real theory testing, you need, probably need a doctorate. But to evaluate a program, master's or better, you're probably there. And I've even seen people, you know, college people and people working in programs do it fine. As long as you, do, as long as you follow the manual so you're not making the same mistakes we all make if we're not thinking about what could go wrong. I can't hear you. I lost your sound. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, on that note, uh, and we have uh, one last question. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, uh, we won't be able to get to the other ones. But um, this one is for um, from Ms. Charlotte Sasson, and it says, if you had limited resources and time, 
what are the best outcome measures to determine the effectiveness of your court? So in terms of outcome measures, it would be, uh, it would be program completion rates, meeting all criteria for graduation. What's your completion rate? Because completion is the single greatest predictor of everything else. Believe it or not, uh, uh, it's, it's less of what you actually did in the program and more that you met the criteria for the program. Uh, it would be rearrest rates at 24 months, and it would be conviction rates at 36 months. If I had to pick three data elements, that would be it. Great. Well, that's a, about all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Marlowe, for, for being so kind to, uh, to, to appear and, and discuss the manual and all, for all of your uh, collaboration over the years with us. It's really something that we, we value greatly. Uh, the fact that you've you've been willing to to to, to be a um, you know an integral part of our program for so long, so thank you, uh, thank you to everybody uh, in attendance. Uh, we we hope and trust that this has been a uh, a useful and productive use of your last hour. Um, again, we've sent a link around to the uh, to the manual itself. Um, we will send around a link to uh, Dr. Marlow's upcoming presentation as well. Uh, when we send out uh, the link to the recording of this presentation, uh, which will very shortly be available. So we'll send a, a follow-up email with that information to everybody who is invited, not just to the folks who attended, um, so that you can, um, if you have folks that weren't able to be here today, they can register and watch uh, this webinar on demand. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be continue to be of use to people. And, uh, and finally, you know, this is uh, hopefully one of, of, of very many webinars on, in, on this topic and on other topics that uh, CCAD works on. So we hope that you will continue to join us and we welcome any feedback that you might have as well. So uh, thanks very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Marlow. And um, we look forward to seeing uh, all, all of uh, you folks out in there, the audience uh, in the future for, for future programs. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay well. Thank you.